first reading is from Isaiah 55, verses 10 to 13. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bed and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and the bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills will burst into song before you and the trees of the fields will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the pine tree and instead of the briars the myrtle will grow. The second reading is from the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 10. Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the poor in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who, who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of the Lord. And speak to God. Good morning everybody. And it's lovely that I can actually see some faces in church in front of you this morning. So, um, just before we come to God's word, can we pray together? Our Father, we, we just long for you to speak to us, to direct us, to show us what you want us to do. So help us to learn. From your word in Jesus. Amen. We are very used to spin today. It's part of modern life, isn't it? Building up things, putting a good gloss on them. But you know, spin has been around for a long time. In the 11th century, there was an explorer of Iceland called Eric the Red. And on a year of exile, he went exploring and he discovered a great island and decided that he would try and encourage people to settle there. So in order to entice them, because they were Icelanders, he called it Greenland. Although in fact it was much icier and colder than their own country. But it worked and he got people to settle. Now that's relevant to what we're looking at today. There was a little illustration because actually what Jesus is doing here is setting out his new life, his abundant life. But it's so opposite to that in every respect because there's no spin and no gloss and it shocks us, Jesus' revelation of what the good life, the happy life, the fulfilled life looks like. Jesus promises to those who follow him Life in all its fullness, abundant life. And yet, when he paints this picture of a world with God in charge, in which we're all of us doing what God wants, it's so against everything that people seem to fight for and want. 
we rush around what we're looking for. We're looking for affluence. We're looking for prosperity. We're looking for ambition. We want the, the good things that we see. And Jesus says, happiness is the other way around. It comes when we give a life over into God's hands. And when Jesus gathers this little group around, and those whom he'd chosen to be his closest followers, to learn from him during his time here, he draws them and he sets them down very deliberately in the way that Anthony described last week. He meant it was serious. He sat down. And he sets before them a vision. A vision of what this new world is going to look like. And what its inhabitants will be like. What life in the kingdom where God is in charge is going to be. And I don't think anybody reading this or listening to this could, include, uh, could accuse Jesus of speaking. Because it turns upside down, it reverses all our normal expectations of what happiness is about. And so Jesus' abundant life unfolds before us. And he begins to teach. And each part of this description, of course, starts with this word, blessed, happy. And Anthony said to us last week, it isn't the conventional idea of running around with a big laugh and a smile on your face, but it's something which is so deep-rooted, so in us, that no circumstances can change it or affect it. And this life, this happiness belongs to those, as he said, who are poor in spirit. Those who are mourning, those who are meek, those who are persecuted. None of which we would normally associate for ourselves. And it's important to realise that Jesus is not talking about different characters here. Somebody who's peacemaker, somebody who's sad, somebody who's poor in spirit. These are all together. All together they make up that person who is blessed by God. They build it up together. A life doing what God wants in his world. And these are not our natural tendencies. That they're not, I'm good at this or, or, or you're naturally like that. But actually, they are just people living out that new life which God gives. And the outcome is that these are the people who are fulfilled, who are living life in all its fullness, happy. I said, you know, that word is off the description of Cyprus. It's called the Blessed Isle, the Happy Isle, and it uses in Greek that same word. And what it means is, when people describe it like that, here's a place where everything that makes life good, that makes life flourish, everything works. And that's what Jesus means. This is a life in which you flourish. And if we just think for a moment of the reaction of those who are listening to Jesus. Remember they were insiders. They were people who were already following Jesus. And Jesus doesn't say that the kingdom belongs to Abraham or the people of Israel, or good people, or even to the Pharisees. These are all the things that people would expect. But actually, what Jesus says is that that kingdom belongs to the poor in spirit. In the Old Testament, God's blessing was often associated with material well-being and prosperity. But there's no actual territory or kingdom here. There's no promised land but it's the unseen kingdom of God. It's a condition where what God wants, his will, is done, always. And that's the key to the state in which human beings flourish, when we are doing not what we want, but what God wants. As we saw last week, the first step to this kingdom is admitting that we are poor in spirit. 
And none of the other steps are possible without that first step, to be poor in spirit. And I think, you know, that's the hardest thing of all for us human beings, to admit that we're broken, that we're imperfect people, and that in the presence of our holy and perfect God, we are nothing. We have nothing to commend us to him. And to recognize that is the very st first step to peace and to a life which is fulfilled. We have to face up to our complete powerlessness and we have to ask for God's help in order to enter into his life. There's no bigging ourselves up with him. I love that hymn, nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to your cross I came. Naked, come to you for dress. Helpless, look to you for grace. All these things that Jesus describes are apparent contradictions. They don't make sense to us naturally. Especially the one that we have today. Blessed are they that mourn, for they will be comforted. Who wants to mourn? Who wants to be unhappy? And yet Jesus says that's part of our being fulfilled. How can it be? I think we understand perhaps more at the moment about mourning than we have many a time. When we think of all the families who've been bereaved during this time, when we think of the loss that there has been and the separation that there's been, and the mourning that there is, Mourning for futures cut off. Mourning for those who've lost their expectations of job or employment. We can understand mourning. It's about loss. It's about something missing. But the real fundamental loss that we have as human beings is that we've lost our way with God. After the communion service, we often say, you know, who has welcomed us back. God has welcomed us back in your son. Because we are lost. And when we realise that, then we do feel grief. And we feel a sense of, of mourning. That we're separated. We're separated in heart and soul from the one who made us. And as long as we're in that state, as long as we're separated, we will be in a state of grief sometimes not consciously recognized. But that mourning is our emotional response to realizing that we are poor in spirit and that we fail to live in the way that the one who made us intended. And that led ultimately, as we know, to Jesus' death on the cross for us. To take the debt that we owed that we couldn't pay the weight of all those failures and to rescue us and to rescue us for a new life and the new life is going to look like this it's going to look like a life which is fulfilled because it's lived in the presence of God we do admit and most of us will recognize that even our best intentions sometimes come to nothing as Paul says the good that we want to do we don't do and then we find ourselves falling into the same old traps again. Oh, it's my temper. Oh, I just speak what I shouldn't do. And when we realize that, when we realize that helplessness, when we see Jesus as he really is, the Son of God, the one who loved us, the one who gave himself for us, then our reaction in seeing ourselves, Anthony mentioned it last week, is first of all, you know, get away from me, you're too holy. But our reaction also is that mourning, that grief for what led Jesus to that cross, for that failure. And I'm sorry, those are often the first words that we use on our way back home, on our way back to the God who loves us. But this morning, that kind of grief, grief for our own sin, that brings comfort because it brings 
as we saw last week, entrance into the kingdom, in entrance into that rule of God, into that place with him. The Messiah was always promised as the one who would bring comfort and who would put right the mourning of the people over their sins. There's that wonderful passage in Isaiah. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Proclaim to her her hard service is completed, her sin paid for. Now that's comfort. That's comfort that lasts. It's comfort that will always be with us. But there is another dimension to this too. And it can help us to see this lived up in Jesus' life. You know, Jesus, the only one who perfectly lived out, who did exactly what the Father wanted every moment of every day of his life on earth. We remember that the Old Testament description of Messiah, of Jesus, was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Jesus was no stranger to mourning. We see Jesus, we see it in his earthly life, we see it at intervals. The, the Bible uses a really strong word that, that he, he felt this gut wrenching movement of pity and compassion because of what he saw. Do you remember the Jesus who stood at the grave of Lazarus? And he saw what death did. He saw the pain it brought to those that, that loved those who'd gone. And he knew that death wasn't part of the Father's plan. And he wept in the presence of death and loss. We saw Jesus who stood on a hill over Jerusalem and looked down at a city that was walking away from God, that didn't want to know him. And he cried over that city because he wanted them to come and receive the comfort that God offered. We see that same reaction in Jesus in the face of disease. Because again, it wasn't part of what the Father wanted for his world, his good world. And we too should share in that mourning of Jesus over all that disturbs God's good world. We need to mourn not just for ourselves, but for the pain of loss in others. We receive comfort, but we also feel immense sadness for those who don't have that comfort, for those who feel that lack. We are free from an accusing conscience, but we're moved all the more to mourn for those who don't know about this love of God available to them in Jesus. We see the people that we love, we see our neighbours, we see them making decisions that harm them and that harm others. And we mourn because we want to see them within the protection of God's love and care. We mourn for them. I used to ponder a lot over what the Bible meant when it said we would share in the sufferings of Christ. What I definitely know it isn't is to do with the cross. It's finished on the cross, it was accomplished. Jesus did everything that needed to be done for us. But when it says we share in his sufferings, I think it's exactly this that we mourn for a world in which people are, are lost. We mourn for them. And that mourning spurs us. It spurs us to pray, it spurs us to speak, it spurs us to act. In any way that we can. Last week when we read, and, and Helen read for us today, it said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And you'll notice the last blessing comes back to that again, is the kingdom of heaven. So those are the end stops. Once we're in God's kingdom, we're in God's kingdom through Jesus. But part of what we experience in our lives as Christians 
is that we learn to look at the long view. I think one thing COVID has taught us is to take the long view. You know, at the beginning, during lockdown, we were told, deny yourselves the privilege of seeing your family, stay in, stay in, stay safe, for the sake of others, to stop this spreading, to keep it from going round. And we learn to take the long view, to make sacrifices for the long view. And Jesus is saying here that not all, we won't see the end benefits of all that we are doing now and all the life that we have now and the hardships that we may experience. But there's a certainty that when Jesus comes, when his kingdom is, comes in its fullness, we will know the full benefits, even of that comfort. We will know how fully we were comforted. Because that promise is there, the certainty is there. We shall be comforted. But we, sh we also need to realise that not everything is fulfilled now, but when Jesus comes. And so here, these promises are not just for our present, but they're for the future. You know, I did... I thought this morning, I mentioned that the Queen in that little extra address that she did at Easter ended with that Vera Lynn song, We Shall Meet Again, she said. And I thought, it cheered us, it encouraged us greatly, but not even she can promise that. The only one who holds the future is our God, and the only one who can promise us certainty is our God. So we, yes, we experience our present comforting and strengthening from the God of comfort in order that we can supply it to a world that's missing it. The God of all comfort comforts us so that we may be able to comfort others in their distress, in their mourning, whatever that mourning may be. And we mourn not only with hope of present comfort, but in the certainty that when God's kingdom comes, when what he wants is done on earth, as in heaven, when life is lived as God intended, when there are no more hungry children and starving children, when the poor aren't the ones who come off worst in every crisis. That's too a cause of our mourning in this world. Then every tear will be dried. Then there will be no more death, no more crying. For those things have passed away. Over the years I've met a lot of people who point to the Sermon on the Mount and say, yes, I don't believe, I don't take the whole thing, but I do live by that ethical code. And I look and I think, but this is impossible for us. Without God, we can't live like this. We can't live in this meekness. We can't be peace givers. We can't comfort those who mourn. We can't be comforted in our mourning. If there's no future with, with God, there's no hope. Then we do mourn. But this life can't be lived out as a human being, just going along as we can. This is a life which can only be empowered by God's Holy Spirit. It's a life that is a contradiction. Because, you know, if you ask most people what they want, or, you know, they do these interviews on the street. What do you want? I want to be happy. I want a happy life. I want a happy life for my children. I want them to have nice homes and good jobs. And I want, of course, we want all those things. But Jesus says when we make those the focus of our lives, we lose our life, the real life. Because until God is the focus of our lives, we will never know what it is to, be, to have that full life in all abundance. And it is a contradiction. Jesus says the ones who lose their lives, for my sake, will find them. And it is this that Jesus offers us. You know, it's a wonderful thing. At the beginning here, at the start, he's called his disciples together. 
This must have been absolutely overwhelming. This is what the future is going to look like. The word persecution comes in later. But this is the life that promises hope. And if our world needs anything now, it needs hope. And it needs the life of God and the life of Jesus. And when our whole attention is on Jesus, that's when we suddenly look around and our life is full and it is abundant. And we haven't realized it because our focus has been on him and it comes as we turn to him. So can we just pray to our God that we will live out this life and turn our neighborhood. Do you remember what happened? Those are early community who lived this life and what other people said of them? These people have turned our world upside down. Well, you know, please God that we can turn the world upside down for him in this way. Amen.